<laughs> All right. Can I tell you? The, the recorder is now running. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Curriculum and Instruction Committee meeting. It's about 5.03 on Wednesday, December 17th, and we're starting. If we can just go around the table and everybody can say their name for the minutes. Start with Mr. Martino. Richard Martino. Carol Bates. Brian Doty. Rob Hurley. Connor Kurtz. Mary Beth Dorsha. Mary Beth Kiesel. Jenny Rexford. Megan Weber. All right, great. We have two members of the public joining us tonight. If you have anything you want to say, feel free to just raise your hand. If you can just state your address, your name and address for the first time you say something and then the rest of the meeting, you should be good. Um, again, there's not much of a huge turnout, so on any item, just feel free to chime in if you'd like. And Dave Ratgeb just walked in the door. So we have a full, full committee. Um, we just wow. reorganized. So the new members of the committee are Brian Doty and Dave Rathgeb. Rich Martino is here ex officio. He's no longer a member of the committee per se. Um, and uh, I guess we can get started with item one, elementary class size. Uh, Mr. Martino asked me to include this on the agenda. If you'd like to say a few words or start off the discussion. Well, it's actually an economic issue that comes under curriculum and instruction because of what it is. This board, which started out with the reputation of being so fiscally conservative, has actually spent a lot of money this year. We, between the Oilers and Bird and Pearl and the Reserve Study and a few other things, we just spent about a half million dollars that we didn't expect. Looking at the enrollment form, and we don't need to make any decisions in this tonight, but it's something we need to think about. Our class sizes that we agreed on early in the year was that we would try to keep it around 25, no higher. Except for kindergarten and first grade, we would keep that lower. Well, our second, third, and fourth grades, which next year will be third, fourth, and fifth, are averaging about 20 students per class, not 25. So looking at five of the classes, under current enrollment, without them declining any farther, which they've declined every month since the beginning of the year, the second grade at AEC, we could have four classes of 24.8 students. The second grade at Monocacy, we could have six classes of 24.8 students. The third grade at BEC could be five classes of 24.4 students. The fourth grade at BEC would be five classes of 24.6 students. And the fifth, the fourth grade at Amity would be five classes of 25.4 students. There's two extra students. Now, the question would then become do we spend $100,000 to keep two classes from becoming 26 instead of 25? And, and my thought would be not, not only that, but between now and next September, odds are those two students will exist the way our, our enrollment has declined. So, or at least exist in Daniel Boone. Right. Yes. <laughs> so, so, thank you for the clarification, Mr. Curtis. But that, that's all I'm saying. I, I know. Mrs. Torsha has some ideas of how she'd like to use some of these positions, and, and I'm not in total disagreement with that either, except that both of these issues, both the, the reducing five positions or using some or all of the five positions, would have to go to the entire board. It's just something the way our enrollment has declined, I think we need to start talking about, because five positions just happens to be the half million dollars we spent. And that would keep us again, you said, under that 25 guideline. But it's, but it's not, because you have to be very, very careful as you are laying out your classes in that you may think that you can stick 25 in, but you always have move-ins, move-outs, and once the classes are established, and letters are going home and parents know who their children are getting, you can't pick up kids or you can't divide a whole class and say, this will work. I'm not saying that this isn't going to work in every event. I see three, three teachers that would 
are definitely going to change because there's seven classes going into six classrooms or four kindergartens going into five first grades. Certainly those things would be adjusted. But I do believe that some of the members of the, the board are interested in trying to reinstitute kindergarten. And that would be a cost neutral. I know that you know ultimately we would save money if we did not have as much staff. But in order for us to be able to bring back kindergarten to a full um, day program, I would like to at least start by having high risk kindergarten classes, one at Monocacy, one at Birdsboro. That would be two of the staff members. We're trying to grow the academic courses at the high school. There's a teacher with a certification that's teaching at the elementary that had been teaching middle level, wants to teach high school science that I would like to move up, but that position has to be replaced. So there are, there, there are things that we need to look at, and certainly I'm not going to try to keep the, the numbers um, as lax as, you know, as comfortable as they are this year. I do agree at the fourth grade level, sitting with 20 students, you can, you know, push those a little bit more. But, you know, we also have to look at, you know, who, who are all those kids that are in there, what is the best combinations, et cetera. So um, that's where my tug's going to go back and forth to trying to make sure that we're laying things out and that we're not taking away because if we're able to balance a budget, we're able to do it without tax increase, and we're able to do it with the staffing that we have, it's the only way that I'm going to be able to continue to put program back in is if I could do it with the existing staff. So you, would there be, this is just hypothetical, is there a place in between those five positions that Mr. Martino suggested and maybe zero, would one or two positions possibly? I, I, there, if we have a retirement, I would definitely, I, and, I, and that's always like a, a question mark, who, who, will go, who would go out, who would be the highest one at the, the top end. Yeah. I would rather see that position go, because the, the people that you're losing are your lowest yeah. paid people. So if I can, yes. So through attrition. I, absolutely, could, okay. and, and, I, and I don't want to sit here and say, no, I, I, you know, I'm going to fight you tooth and nail that. I'll be very reasonable, and I'll work the numbers, but it's very hard to determine right now. With, and, and knowing that enrollment is going down, we're not seeing that completely happening on the Birdsboro and Monocacy side. We are seeing some of those class sizes growing. We are seeing the numbers decreasing a bit over on the um, AMI side. With that being said, if we would start to put back in full day kindergarten, would our numbers go back up or to some degree? Because I do know there are, um, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, how many students are attending um, Immaculate that you know potentially could be here because once they start in that program, they're they're not as likely to come back, you know, for the first grade, second grade. We're not seeing a lot. What you mentioned an at risk kindergarten <coughs> program. Would you like? Would you like to do that next year? Yes, I would. I would like to have two um, full day at risk kindergarten built, um, classes at one at Monocacy, one at Amity, in order to, to keep it even. Um, and it would be a an evaluation process. Those would be our students who would be our neediest. We would then be saving some monies that could be going to the that would be going to the IU because we do have children who are early intervention. We're paying about twelve thousand, thirteen thousand dollars a student for being there because they're entitled to a full day kindergarten. How many students use that program? Um, I. I believe there are two there this year. Okay, so it's twenty-four thousand. Right, and that doesn't—that's not including the transportation. Okay. So, um, if anytime we can gain kids back in, that—that's a, a a benefit. But as long as we don't have a full day program for them to fit into, um, we're losing. They, they'll go back to the IU. So, definitely, I'm I'm willing to look at both sides of it. But I, I would like to be able to have some flexibility in trying to make sure that we're continuing to grow programs, especially in areas that we have you know, lost things. And if you're looking at um, any type of cyber education or trying to you know, grow that, that takes bodies. It, it can't all just happen via a kid. Kids can't sit in a room without supervision. In terms of a timetable, and I don't want to co-opt all the other questions, when do we need to make a decision on um, class size and the kindergarten? At risk kindergarten. Well, I would like to have, know about the kindergarten by the time that we go into registration, which is in February, correct? That's when we traditionally do kindergarten registration. So I would like to be able to say we're going to be offering something. Um, I think Mr. Rathgab would like to probably see more than one class, you know, one class per, per building, but um, I think that would be a good start to be able to sustain us. 
Um, with regard to class sizes, I have a much better idea the later May, June area. Um, even that, that would probably be the best place because that's the end of our year and if we would have to do any furloughing at that point as a result of the you know, class sizes going down, we need to do that within that time. And then if we would have to bring somebody back, we could do that more easily once we flip over to July, August. Okay. For the, um, <clears throat> for the at-risk uh, program, I mean, how, how many kids do, uh, do you think would be? 15 to 18 at the most. For, for both? For both, for yes, both. yes. I mean, so could, could, could that in essence be one teacher or does that need to be three, two? It would have to be one, it would have to be two teachers because it would be a full day program. Right. Well, but they would have those kids all day long. Correct. Well, couldn't it, I mean, could it be one teacher? With 30 kids? Well, one, I'm just wondering, one, wondering if, you, yeah. if you could have it in one building and bus, yeah, bus those, bus those, those kids the, to, 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 to the maybe if yeah. it's, it's at monocacy, you, you just have the one. Is that too many for that? Yes. yes. Well, there's Is another challenge. Well, there's something else there. These kids, students are already going to be, they're already in our half day program, correct? No. Oh, so they're so, at the IU. Some, right. The children that are attending the IU are at the IU all day so long. So it would be a net increase of eight, well, it would be 18 more students coming they're back. Not, there's not 18 of them. Two, there, there only could be two. one or two, three, who, depending on the oh, number yes, of children that are in early intervention. But that I'm would, talking about they're going to be, okay, so wait, at the IU there are two students, yes. roughly. Let's just say two I'm for I'm going to say for this year, yeah. right. And then we're going to have add 16, let's just say to use that 18 number, but those 16 who aren't at the IU, they're already going to be in half-day. Correct. Program. They would be in a half-day program. So really, we're talking about, if they're already going to be there, why can't we have a teacher in the afternoon at one building and in the morning at another, and they're already going to, they're already there anyway, so it's not like we're bringing in to, do you understand what I'm trying to say? I understand what you're trying to say, okay. and, I'm, and, and I don't know how that will impact the numbers at the buildings, but number one, you don't want them to travel between the two buildings because well, there's just a lot of different reasons that I don't have to probably get into right now. It would be so much easier and, and more consistent of a program if there was a program in their school where they're going to go from kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, obviously, they're moving from kindergarten to third grade at Monocacy and then, you know, um, sorry, kindergarten, second grade, and then third to, through fifth grade. But you want them to have the same teacher morning and afternoon. Sure. Right. Some children could could possibly leave i don't know what it would look like and and maybe it would end up being just you know existing teachers depending on our numbers That's and what how I'm we saying. can look so at so we it. have am and pm kindergarten in both locations right uh well i guess they teach really the same thing in the morning and the same thing in the afternoon right? but in this case the It'll afternoon be, would be a different program and yeah. it would be working on what these individuals are are really in need of real really honing in you know making well what i was getting at earlier and i'm still kind of getting at is that it's not we're not going to be having 18 more students it's not going to be nine no. to nine they're already in our system correct so we're really not t two teachers for 16 for 18 students 16 of whom are already in our system keeping two positions dedicated for that seems I don't it, want to say it, excessive, but it seems excessive. It could be. I, and I would have to look at what the numbers are, and until we get enrollment numbers to really be able to evaluate, yeah. And this isn't on the agenda, so I don't want to talk about it too much, but would you be able to come up with a presentation on what you'd like to do mm -hmm. that we can discuss as a committee here to take to the full board? If you want it done by February, I guess next meeting would be the time to, to talk about it in this committee. What do you want? The at-risk full-day kindergarten. Okay, you want to you wanna see board. what that's going to look like? Well, if you could have, yeah, if you could have a plan with numbers mm -hmm. and a cost, like a bottom line, how much it will cost to add, um, like just maybe a little presentation or something mm -hmm. that we could take forward okay. to the full board. And if you want to do it by February, I think it would be good to do that. Okay. I want to have meeting. a couple questions that I'd like filled in there. Sure. How many students are in the Everest classes at the IU? Those aren't, those children are children that are in the, um, three through five year old uh, early intervention program. And we could have potentially, I don't know, Melanie's not here, but do you recall how many numbers of students you've gone? It's been an all day long you know, process where we would be evaluating the kids that were coming in. There could be 20 of them. But of that 20, not all of them would be eligible 
for the full day program the following year. They, they have to um, exhibit different um, deficits that would you know really require them to have programming for a full day. Is that, yeah, is that my question? My question is in the IU classes, what's the enrollment like? How many kids are in a class? Oh, um, probably about probably 15 might be the highest. I would say maybe 13 to 15 but in their classroom. Two teachers here that have nine kids in their class. No, no, I wasn't looking at that. I was looking at identifying 15 children who would, who would need all day, who would benefit from all day kindergarten at Monocacy and 15 children that would benefit from all day kindergarten at Amity. So of those 15, if they're, if they're 15 of the groups of kids that are coming in, then that could change the other scenario of what classes, of what the kindergarten enrollment is in those other classes. What is a high-risk child? A high-risk child is a child who has a developmental delay, um, who is not able to identify letters, because typically they are identifying them by the time that they're ready to come into kindergarten. They're not able to count. Their um, potty, potty training is um, a setback for them, that they may not have achieved that. Um, their self-help skills are very limited. They're not able to maybe put their own code on. They may not be able to um, just, you know, do simple things that you take for granted. Um, it, it's, it, their academics are really are, are far behind to where you are doing a lot of introduction, a lot of one-on-one -on -one, um, things that are really pretty basic learning um, skills for most children who are five years old. Well, right now we have 213 children in kindergarten, so you're saying 14% of those have all these problems? I'm not saying all of them do, but I am saying that there is a large group of kids that would benefit from being in a kindergarten classroom all day long. And just like we did for well, I think all just, students would. Can I just restate Yeah, exactly, but I'm trying so to start with the lowest group. We have two at risk who are entitled to full day right. kindergarten by law. Right. So you're talking about sort of expanding the definition. Correct, I am. To scoop up the kids that are Correct. at risk and, and uh, required by law to get full day, but extending the definition a little bit to include more of those kids that wouldn't. Correct. I'm looking at the children who haven't had an experience in a, a preschool mm -hmm. or any kind of um, type of educational program the children who there there are so many children that are sitting at home that aren't read to that aren't you know having interaction with other children or with adults there there's there's so a pulling lot pulling them out of the general population would then allow the teacher to move forward with the rest of those kids a little bit faster. Yeah. Yeah. earlier you can the, I'm thinking long term the earlier you can catch them the younger they are the, the earlier you can intervene and have to do less supports long term That's because true. it's one of those things that you, if you identify them right. early and, and get right. them more on target with their peers right. first grade they may not need as much support or may not <clears> be, <throat> right. need to be identified that you can catch them and do a lot of things a lot of the basic things and even again the structure the routine the, the sit in the desk the, the, those things which distract the getting in group. line walking in the yeah, hall the, just so all, all the normal transition as, as it is to say it's really a cost consideration mm -hmm. too that you have to think can early the, the other thing is, is that all the money that has been coming down from the state that we have been receiving, whether it was the accountability block grant or now it's the ready to learn grant, all of that money, it's really being curtailed towards early intervention and early literacy skills, early pre-K programs, kindergarten, you know, full day kindergarten programs. You can't, you can't use it for our half day program. And so we're receiving about $378,000, $380,000 for this year. And with that, we couldn't put it right into program that is a, a affecting early literacy or early education. We had to use it for different programs that the grant now, was saying we could use Would we it get for. more money from We that? wouldn't get more money, but we could put this money but into I mean, that. So if I had two kindergarten classrooms that were full day, we could put the money into but that. I mean, as long as we're not getting more money, it's really immaterial you because take it away from somewhere else. yeah, it's just we're reallocating. Taking, we're, it, but but the bigger we wouldn't we would be taking away from things that we are being creative in doing 
but we know that the best place for this money is in a full day kindergarten or bringing pre-K on board. Well, that, that's where you're... We're, we're beating this to death, but let me go back to my original premise. Our, our declining enrollment dictates that we lose some teachers. Any additional programs would have to be submitted and approved by the board. So right. mm -hmm. that's where we're at enrollment-wise. Mm -hmm. Okay, I do want to move on with the agenda here, uh, but that's just stuff to keep in mind for the future. One, one final note on sure. the presentation, though. If you could identify those that would qualify, would have qualified this year across our kindergarten body, maybe we could use that percentage to make um, projections about next year, please, okay. in your presentation. And how, and how would you identify students coming in because we'd, the first time we're seeing them is kindergarten mm -hmm. and they would we'd give screenings we would we would use different criteria that we've used in the past okay. there's a kindergarten <laughs> dibbles you know that would be the biggest indicator if you have you know 15 30 children that are coming in that have no clue about letter identification what a letter is you know that's that's so, not that something after. we're doing today is it, are we or are we screening kids today to try to not as not as um, specifically as we would. But this it's not criteria for right. entrance right now. Right. But we do universally screen all kindergarten students so at the beginning of the year to see, um, you know, where they fall. Are they okay. high risk students, uh, low risk? And this could wait until the presentation, I guess. But I just want to know, like that stuff you do, that they're in the classrooms already when you do the Dibbles test and all that. So but we would, would do it ahead of time. Okay. We, we would, you would do it for every change, student, or would you? We would. We would look at our kindergarten wow. garden registration, and we would put in, implement something so that we had our criteria set up as to what we're looking for, and who. And, and here's the bar. And if you're if you're not able to make that bar, and you're falling below it, then then you're obviously a child who's. If we can intervene now and get you for a little bit more time now, then it, you know in the long run it's going to be. Best okay. for everyone. And there's also a, a few districts that already have the at-risk uh, kindergarten in place. Everybody so, except for yeah. Danny Boone and Boyertown have a full-day kindergarten program. Everyone well, I mean, in this I mean, county. And then there's some that, that does have at-risk, too. They yeah. Really they do some it. call it an at-risk program, right? Is that, mm -hmm. but it's so, like a de facto kind of standard. It's, more, it, it's, it's, it's probably more special education related, and there's probably children who so have So we're not IDs. recreating the wheel, I guess, no. is what. Okay. All right, well, if we can move on then to item two. My goal, if we can finish this meeting around 6.30, if that works, that would be ideal, because I know there's an Amity Township meeting that I'd like to go to, and I know Mr. Martino would as well. I don't know if Mr. Rathgeb is going to go and there's a supervisor meeting. I'm going to work out Taekwondo. Oh, okay, <laughs> never mind. Mr. Rathgeb has other plans. <laughs> um, professional staff schedule. This is something that Mr. – another thing Mr. Martino, I believe, brought up. Um, would you like to talk about the professional staff schedule? Yeah. <laughs> is this, 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 this is all your <laughs> this should be the last item. <laughs> no, I mean the other items are. Okay, we'll fly through. Yeah, well. Yeah, because we're not flying through this one. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone here needs to understand something because we, I've never really talked about it, but I made a living out of promoting efficiency. And, and efficiencies are, are made by the obvious, and, and that's not having extra people when you don't need them, but it's also utilizing the people you have in, in proper scheduling. And the, the DBA arbitration case raised this issue in my mind, and, and I want to thank the DBA for doing that. Sitting there listening to, to the testimony at the arbitration hearing, the teachers were complaining that they had only five minutes before class and five Mr. minutes Mr. Martino, I do have a question. Can we talk about the arbitration hearing? Is that something we can talk about publicly? The arbitration hearing's over, yes. Okay. I wasn't sure. I just wanted to check. But I'm not even getting into the arbitration as much as the question became, in my mind, what is, what is prep time for? Prep time is in order to prepare for the classes that you're teaching in that day or for that week. It is the time to, if you're, you know, writing your lesson plans, uh, making sure that you have all of the, you know, materials together that you're using. Um, it's to, you know, plan for your day so that you're, you're prepared um, or plan for your week or, you know, to be making grading papers. 
um, evaluating, you know, whatever testing you might have done, you know, anything along yeah, those lines. I guess lines. my point is some of the prep time was before class, some was after class. So if you use your prep time after class to prep for tomorrow, mm -hmm. and you call in sick tomorrow, you got paid for nothing. I mean, you, you what? If you <laughs> use prep time this afternoon to prepare for tomorrow's class, and you call in sick tomorrow, it's a waste of time. Not really. Well, not the substitute has, has to. to you have to prep for even when you're not Right. You follow your. But your your your, your sub didn't prep. You prepped. Right. And, and for your class, you. which you have ownership to, which you are accountable to, to the state. <laughs> All right. But my my question would be. You know, all too often in every industry, we accept what is instead of looking how we could do things better. And, and let me use the middle school for example. And Jenny, only because I'm more familiar with the middle school than high school. It has nothing to do with you. You just got there. <coughs> but the buses unload around 7.20? 7 o'clock? 7.05? Yeah, all, it's all different times up until 7.30. Where do the kids go? Uh, the students who get there very early at 7 o'clock are in the cafeteria. There are teachers who are in the cafeteria with them to monitor them. Uh, students who get there around 7.15-ish, 7.20, they are in um, a large group instruction room where, again, there are some teachers who are monitoring them for that time. The rest of them get there very close to 7.30 that they are able to go out to their lockers and get their things and get to home. So the teachers that are in the cafeteria and the teachers that are in the large group and study room, room whatever you call mm -hmm. it, they're they're on the clock, so to speak. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's part of their work thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That that's part of their work thing. Okay, so the kids that come in seven thirty. Mm -hmm. Some of them are entitled to breakfast. Yeah. What are the teachers doing while they're at breakfast? They have homework. They're taking attendance. Um, they're doing paperwork kinds of things with the students, handing out things that they may need to take home, um, announcements. But are they doing during... it again when the kids finish breakfast? No. No. Breakfast is during the homeroom time. So, for instance, homeroom is up until 7.57. So... Um, during that time, kids go to breakfast after the teacher knows that they're there and can take their attendance. The kid will go to breakfast. The teachers are then there with the students who don't go to breakfast, um, doing a variety of things with those kids. Kids come back from breakfast and go to their first period class. Okay, and, and one more question, or a series of questions. How long is each period? Because I, I don't know. 43 minutes. 43 minutes. And how much time is between periods? Three minutes. So they have three minutes to get from one room to the next? Yes. And go to their locker, go to the go, lavatory. Yeah, they need to do those things. Yeah. Three minutes, yeah. okay. And long as long as you can do anything. 30 minutes. So you go to lunch for 30 minutes, but there, there's other classes going on at the same time. Yes. So what are the teachers doing for that other 16 minutes if the teachers are at lunch for 30 minutes? Well, the schedule is actually, um, I'm trying to figure out how I can explain this that makes sense. The schedule is kind of staggered. So for instance, the sixth grade has lunch first. They go to lunch from basically 11 to 11.30. Um, the other students, the seventh and eighth graders, are in class for 43 minutes. So their class goes until, say, 11.43. When the sixth graders are finished with their lunch, they go to class. So there's a group of classes that are just for sixth grade that start when sixth grade finishes lunch. Those teachers are eating lunch while the sixth grade eats lunch so then they can then teach those sixth graders when they're finished with their lunch. I hope that made sense. <laughs> uh, it, it, just, it just seemed to me that if, if you had the prep time before school started, you would have all your teachers in place as the kids came into school and, and the prep time would be over with. We don't have the flexibility of doing that based upon the school start day, and um, th that's not something that we can dictate, like that they, I mean, we do use the be the 30 minutes before school starts in most of the buildings, especially at elementary, and we do count that as part of their prep time. Um, with the middle school and high school, 
virtually the students and the, the teachers can come in at the same time. I've had teachers late to home room. Well, we were I, waiting in the hallway. It surprised me. Yeah. But that's because of the that is because of the way that the. I mean, high school doesn't doesn't Mr. Hankel have to get some volunteers that are there early, then they can leave early. We so in order for us to be and able to cover yeah. kids and make sure that buses can flow, because the biggest problem is is that the bus <clears throat> the transportation needs to be able to drop kids and go, and kids have to be with somebody. They just can't roam wildly, so. You know, that's the unfortunate part. A lot of time things that happen in the beginning of the day for the elementary is that that's where IEP meetings are happening, faculty meetings are taking place, parent meetings, anything that needs to take place before the students are sitting in their seats, that's, that's usually occurring during that 30 minute block of time too. So yes, virtually it would be wonderful to be able to do that and have prep, you know, for everybody at the same time and not be interrupted and for the day to go along, that, that would be ideal. Why are you saying you can't dictate that? Can well, because we, we can't change that? the seven the 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 work day. I mean, they they're, they're scheduled for seven and a half hours. Right. right? But, but it's I, a half hour yeah, exactly seven and a half hours. Don't say what time they start. I believe you can dictate. You can. The contract does not say their starting time has. Correct, to be but but X. for for but the students are in school from seven thirty until two thirty. So if the teachers are coming in with them at 7.30, the only half hour time that I have is at the end of the day, which is prep time um, or meeting time or you know staff development time or anything else time. Well, with the contract, prep time has to be prep time. It can't be. Prep time has to be 210 minutes at the middle <clears throat> high, secondary level and 240 at the elementary. That, okay. But it has to be equivalent to the amount of time that a class is taught is the way that it's laid out in the contract. Does so at the secondary, be, it has to be each day, though, right? Correct. It's supposed. Well, they're supposed to have two hundred and ten minutes yeah, by the week. of prep per week. By the week. Yeah. Oh, by the okay. Week. Yeah. All right. Right. So I could flip the day and say we're starting school at seven o'clock and letting the teachers walk out the door with the students at two twenty. I would like you to consider something that I, you and I talked about personally, um, Mrs. Torsha, about having a schedule similar to Birth Catholic. I just have nine periods and everybody's doing the same thing at all periods. Didn't you express an interest in looking at it from a fresh perspective, which I think is what Mr. Martin is driving at. Would you cons are you interested in developing a new schedule mm -hmm. where there's more? Can I say at the high school level, I've given it a lot of thought. When we redid our bell schedule for me, I looked at it in a lot of ways. I've given this a lot of thought. And there's, there's a couple things you can do. I don't know if you can get all the prep time in the morning, mm -hmm. but and you can't teach all the same classes at the same time, like as far as the master schedule goes. You can't have all your English classes first period. We don't no, have I to, like, what, I didn't mean we that. We can talk about that. that but Ten minute homeroom, and then they all go to activity period for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then there, mm -hmm. that combination is where you get your prep time. Mm -hmm. And as then period one, you period can't, two, can't they too, get but. prep time right in the morning because designed by the schedule. Uh, but you can't have, they can't have prep time and have students in front of them. What's that? They can't have, right, they, right, right. The, so, and the activity period is only is where they go to uh, yearbook and not all the, the right. No, I'm, I'm, yes, I, I am very so interested in looking at that and, and I think at, that, at this point, if, if I can be so bold exactly as to Mrs. suggest a fresh look. What I'm saying is, is and, or there are efficiencies to be had. I, and I don't, we don't, look. we don't disagree. Like keep working within the same <laughs> constraints yeah. the way we always do. No. We don't, we don't, we don't disagree. Okay. We've all had that conversation yeah. and Mr. Hurley's been looking at that from his level, having the experience at the middle school and with Megan's addition to the high school, we are looking at that, how we can be utilizing the time more efficiently okay. and even growing the class, the, the growing the, um, the, the time of a class a little bit longer so that we're, Having right. kids in class as opposed to study right. halls, or having kids, you know. So yes, we uh, we are. Just yeah. that model of works and tell me if there's anything there that mm -hmm. yeah. could be applied to us that would make us more efficient and, and address that issue. I think we could. And with the, for the high school in particular, so because I know that the teachers are there for after school no, questions as well. That would obviously impact. Right. And there's a balance between and and I, I quite honestly haven't spoken to this at very many levels because it's still in my head and figuring out and the schedule and the project-based assessment piece. But I've given a lot of thought about when the school day starts, how we use our time, um, and what tutoring may look like. 
Yeah, and maybe, 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 maybe it's a, a, a does not be each teacher, no, but maybe a teacher is able to. Ultimately, yeah. and I can't, I'm not making any promises, but at some point we need an academic center. We're not only going to have to do remediation for our, our, our students, but we need to have, and, and again, it's a staff, and part of it's a staffing issue and, and coverage and making sure everybody's covered, but it is ultimately my goal to look at the classes we're teaching and, and trying to offer these new courses. But we need to put things in place and, and make sure that we're providing supports for our students. We so, so have some staff that's available and, after. And take it and, yeah. you know, study halls. Some kind of center. Kids are in study halls. Well, I'm looking at assigning students based on their test scores to their remediation programs, and whether we call it that or not. But the students who need support in the algebra, the biology, and the literature, providing that and making it part of their school day instead of a study hall and making sure that I have an English teacher available for the literature and a biology teacher for this. I've looked at it logistically. It is going to be extremely tight on my staffing and I have to consider the other options. But I want to grow that, that we need to have students, you know, we can run weekly reports and identify students who are failing or struggling academically, that we can then require them to attend the academic but again, I'm just coming on board. Like I've, I've thought through, but that's it's a lot of good stuff. It's either there, there for now and see what they get. Sure, you'll, you'll, you'll probably get it right by the time my kids are all graduated. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's where we yeah. roll probably. out the PDAs, though, I imagine, right? Mm -hmm. You're looking at the academic centers as being the mechanism that we deliver the project-based assessments. <coughs> yeah, yes. and, that and that's what the remediation piece. If I can implement a remediation piece that then feeds into the project-based assessment, we can bring in all then, those other kids, and then I can make sure that I have the support. Uh, I really and, like that idea. And, it's, it's all coming together, but it's it's not something it's not something you want to just throw Don't at the wall it. and hope it sticks. You got to think it through and like I mean. I hope you will think it through in the time frame in the context of what we're saying too about changing the bell schedule, mm -hmm. changing. You know, there to me right now there are no limits right. to what we can do Good. because okay. we need to do what's best for kids. The state's pushing down more requirements. We only have the staff that we have. We only have the time in the 7.5 hours. The way everything's written, everything is being considered. Um, we run a 30 minute lunch, do we need a 30 minute lunch? Can we get away with a 25 minute lunch? You know, and, and I'm, I was in every single lunch period today and looking at them and going, do we have that extra time? Like if I'm gonna rebuild the bell schedule, I wanna know, do I need 25 minutes? Do I need 28? Do freshmen need 28 and seniors need 25? Like what what is the perfect thing here that there are no limits into what I would consider okay. as far as the pieces, but I, I also have counted up places where are required things that we need to make sure we have teachers available for that are the duty periods that I need a teacher to monitor students. It may not be able to be a true instructional period. Like this year we put detention time during their lunches. And that has been a phenomenal deterrent. The kids mm -hmm. hate it and it has been it has been great. It was Tom and Jenny were really working with it last year um, and Ding and it has been something very good. Well, that's gonna take a staff person to monitor that, but can I combine that with something else, potentially? You know, can I do things, again, it's all on the table for me, as far as all of the pieces of the puzzle, Could it be um, and we'll develop them. Could it be prudent, I know we don't have aides, really, mm -hmm. like we used to, mm -hmm. but instead of having professional teachers monitoring lunches and monitoring detentions, mm -hmm. I know it would be an added cost at first to hire aides to do that, but could it be could we see a cost savings and that we could have teachers teaching more <laughs> classes or what are your thoughts on that or anybody? Um, um, you have to have a certified teacher supervising students. Like you have to have a teacher supervising your students. You can't put an aide with them without a teacher if I'm remembering what I've Well heard. would we be able to have one teacher in the cafeteria and then aides? And, and yes, but cafeterias in those unstructured times are the times when the, the craziest things happen and when you decrease the number of the professional staff who've taught a portion of them, who know them, who can walk by and okay. go, guys, knock it off, and it immediately is done in comparison to somebody who only sees them in the cafeteria and doesn't know their names right away, doesn't know the, you know, and it takes a while, and even then, like, I have teachers who've been in there almost two full quarters who are like, I don't know who that kid is, and, I, and I'm trying to get him, and I've sent him the lunch detention, it's not that mm -hmm. I don't know, but it's one of those that there's not a rapport. Okay. That it's, it's something that I, I know that there'll be a cost savings too, and it's not something that is out of, out of the realm, but I don't want to put ourselves in such a situation that we create bigger problems and, and bigger safety issues. Like, I don't want to go sure. that route. Um, I want to instead see what we can do with our current schedule and, and really, you know, think this through and think it out. Um, 
and again, I'm all about efficiency. I want things to make sense. Like when you said that, I thought, oh, I'm, I'm there. I want, I want the process to be straightforward. I want everybody to know what it is. Um, and I want it to be easily followed. Um, I'm an algebra teacher by trade for a reason. It's a process, it's a situation, and I like to get right to the point, um, cut and dry. So that is definitely something that is um, on my radar. And um, definitely, I know at the high school level, I will continue to analyze and go through it. Once our course selection process will begin in January, once we start getting those numbers, that's why I want to be able to, and thank you for approving, once we can do that and we have the numbers of the class sizes, we can say who's our remediation group, who are the ones that have to do it, who are the ones we'd like to do it, you know, and who are the ones that the parents want to volunteer, whatever the case may be, or the students. Once we have the numbers, then I can get to the black and white and break it into the parts and the pieces and figure out my whole dynamics of how it's going to piece together to create the schedule for next year. Again, given the confines of the contract and the teachers and, you know, what are our needs as a building as a whole. Okay. Great, um, thank you. I'm on the way for your report. All right, have we exhausted that subject for now? Mr. Martino, are you good? Yeah, we said we'd look at it. Okay, <laughs> very good. Okay. Uh, next up on the agenda, challenging advanced language arts learners at the middle school. I believe this is Mr. Mr. Martino, Mr. Kurtz, excuse me. Please. If we could just keep in mind, uh, save some time at the end um, for the public in case they have yeah. issues to bring. Can yeah, that. That's fine. Yeah, that's we should probably get that on the agenda just as a standing item, mm -hmm. public Please. comment. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, basically, I would like to add sixth grade honors language arts to um, what we're are currently offering in sixth grade. It does not add, it, there's, it's cost neutral. Um, essentially, right now in sixth grade, we have um, an honors and accelerated section in math, but we do not have any differentiation in the language arts area um, and if you look at our PVOS scores which show student growth the students who are scoring the highest or at the, at the upper end are our most um, advanced learners they're actually showing negative growth in sixth grade and so um, to me right there that shows that they're not being challenged um, because obviously they're still, still scoring advanced so they're doing well but they're not showing a year's worth of growth. Yeah. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that they are in class with um, other students who are finding language arts to be more challenging, um, who need more attention, et cetera, who aren't reading at the level they are, who aren't getting the materials that they could be getting. Um, and yes, we can differentiate at that level, but I think what makes most sense is to offer an honors language arts section. And like I said, it doesn't add a teacher or anything like that. It's just a matter of creating the section when I do the schedule for next year. Well, first, I'd like to say I think it's incredible that we can monitor and we can see that there's actually negative academic growth. I think that's incredible. But also, um, one thing I remember when I was in sixth grade, and let me know if it's changed, you could tell there were levels of math. There was an advanced class, an accelerated class, but the students <coughs> didn't. Well, they yes. knew at the end of the year, but they didn't really know. They didn't choose like you do for high school that, to that's be. That's a big thing for me. That's that's go, that's not happening anymore. Oh, okay. I can't, I, they need to have names, and that's that's my next item. So. Oh, okay. okay. All right, we can get there. I was just wondering, would <laughs> so students yes, would be sorted they, into this right advanced? Right now, they don't have a, a, an exact title. However, there is honors math. Yeah. There is accelerated math, and then there is sixth grade math. So. They don't actually uh, have that title, but that's what they are. Okay. So this would be that it would have the title Honors Language Arts, and when we get to the math part, they will have the title Honors All right. Math. All right. Well, that's good. And But they're sorted into this on their own. There's no, like, at the high school, you can choose if you want to take Honors, Accelerated, right. but they're driven into this. Yes, and that is in the criteria that is in my, as the next bullet point. <laughs> okay, good. I, I hope I'm not jumping too far ahead then. That's okay. Um, they're kind of interrelated. All right, yeah. <laughs> I, I wonder almost, once you're in, like I know for math, it's very structured. You're in it and you're kind of tracked to, you're not going to be able to take honors pre-calc in high school if you're only at the, if you're at the basic level in middle school. Is that correct, Mrs. Weber, for the there, most part? It, I was going to say, it depends on where they're at and it depends on when they make the change. If okay. they make it early enough at a middle school level or even going, into the, or probably eighth grade is the really very yeah. important All right. time where they have to make the decision. They take algebra one in the eighth grade level. They have the opportunity to take just about anything. 
Okay. But it's it's prior to that um, they don't. And once they if they don't take algebra one, they may not get to the true highest honors calc. Well, that's what I want to get at here. I want to make sure that there will still be flexibility at the middle school level. I don't want a, a sixth grader's ability to learn. That won't allow them to take uh, AP English right. in 12th grade. And I know that, I mean, there could be a lot of maturation between sixth grade and seventh grade at the yeah. middle school level. Yeah, and so in the criteria, sure. to um, it outlines how they would go from, if they are just, say, in general, sixth grade math, but they do really well, it explains how they would then move on to honors or accelerated math in seventh grade. And like Megan said, when they get to eighth grade, that's really the key because okay. if they're taking algebra one in eighth grade, then that's then they're on track to do pretty much anything they want in high school. So, um, but we can be very flexible and I am very flexible. So even if a student is in regular sixth grade language arts or if we're talking about math and you know they're doing really well, I don't have a problem moving them. Good. I mean, and we've done that and Rob's done that. So. Um, I am never somebody who's going to say you're stuck here and that's where you're going to be. I mean, if, if you can move, then we'll move you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, good. I, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but I know you said that your second bullet point is very closely related. Would, does anybody have anything specific to adding advanced language arts? Is anybody opposed to that? It's cost yeah. neutral? Okay, I guess you got to go ahead from this committee to do that. <laughs> um, and then moving on, criteria for middle school math and language arts. Well, is it an administrative change, or is it is that something that requires full board approval? If it's just, just revamping kids into a different class, it's like it's using the data that we are through the assessments that we have to give by the state and uh, identifying the students. We're just renaming a class. Yeah, we so have full board. Resources for them, though. Books What's that? Are, is it going to require additional resources? No. 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 It's, but you, it's going to. We don't approve a middle school anything. course selection guide as a full board. What's that? Uh, I'm just thinking committees. Committees recommend. Yeah. But we. That being said, if it's an administrative thing that we don't have to approve, she didn't even need to bring it. She didn't. No, need to she didn't. Well, she, she, she was bringing it here because courtesy. we're trying to have conversation yeah. about different things. We just want to make yeah. sure we're sharing things yeah. with yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I think that's but great. why wouldn't you share it with the rest of the board? We will during the report. In the report. We don't. I don't know if we need to take a vote on things we don't need to vote on, but I agree. All right. Um, so, uh, criteria for middle school math and language arts placement. Um, in the last two months. Oh, okay. oh, sorry. <coughs> oh, sorry. Do you, do you have something, Mr. Doty, if you have a question? No, I just, I wasn't sure if we did have to vote on it or not. What you thinking, Mr. It's, it's just a realignment of, uh, it's just how we're setting up a team yeah. at the in sixth grade. It's, it's how we're restructuring a class that, it, it's not, you know, there's, are you looking at writing curriculum? Well, there are, uh, Mrs. Kiesel is already doing curriculum writing, okay. and so the way it's that they're doing incorporated the curriculum into writing, it. it's just incorporated into it, so it's not even, okay. that that's it. Yeah, you don't lack the authority to do it on your own, you're just... And I don't, yeah, yeah. so... <laughs> it's, it's no different than... It's no different than us identifying students for Title I or identifying right. students for the um, math, Title yeah. I math. It's, it's now identifying the top kids who aren't showing growth, which so, is their being measured on as well. If we had three, and, three sections of right. regular language arts, that would have two sections right. of regular and one. Right. Right. Exactly. If we can just so, get an item, what so, if we can get an item printed on the agenda under curriculum instruction, just saying we're adding advanced placement. Well, or, not advanced, but, yeah. Well, as long as I remember, I'm saying. All right. So I think we've. Go ahead. So we're, we're going to move on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, both my math and language arts teachers had come to me very early in the year and said that um, they were unhappy with basically the way that um, the placement criteria was written for kids to move from honors or to honors or out of honors, etc. cetera. Um, they felt like they weren't really following it as it was. It's, it had kind of gotten out of date um, and wanted to look at rewriting. And so, Mr. Martino, while you're, while you're standing, I, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> there we go, the lights are back on. And so when we had department meetings, I sat down with the, um, with the departments and said, okay, you know, what are we looking at? We took a look at the high school. I got the high school's course selection guide that was approved for next year so that our criteria looked very similar to the criteria that was being used at the high school. We switched everything 
for the most part to letter grades and, and things like that. So, um, and especially the ones that are referring from seventh to eighth grade match almost identical to what it looks like from going from eighth grade to ninth grade, so that that was similar. Um, and then um, I got everybody to agree. We are planning to post it on the website so that parents are aware because one of the things is that parents, and you alluded to that in the last item, number one, our math is secret, and I don't think that it needs to be that way. Um, so making the criteria available to parents so that they can see, okay, here's what my kid needs to do to move on to honors. Here's what my kid needs to maintain in order to stay in honors. Um, so that we wanna be able to post that on the website so that they can see what that is. Um, and really it's available to high school parents because it's in the course selection guide, so it only makes sense to do that. Um, and then um, that's pretty, and then we talk to the elementary to find out what's available so that they can make that decision going from fifth to sixth grade. Um, I do have to say that on the language arts placement, the um, second bullet point in both of them should say sixth or seventh grade language arts because it's really the same criteria for both. So it just says sixth grade, but it should be both. What um, that, please? In the second bullet point, in the, in, from sixth or seventh grade honors to seventh or eighth grade honors, and then the last one, the sixth or seventh grade language arts to sixth or seventh or seventh or eighth grade honors. The second bullet point in both really should say final grade of a B in sixth or seventh grade honors, and then final grade of an A in sixth or seventh grade language arts. It just says six. So that was my fault. I typed that, so it's my mistake. Um, but essentially, I just wanted to, I want to be more transparent and have parents know this is what my kid needs to do because right now there's just a lot of questions and a lot of, well, how was that decision made? Why was it made? Why is my kid here? Why is my kid there? Um, and then the whole idea of the math classes not having those titles when they had those titles in high school again. That's again just saying, okay, why are we not using those same names in the middle school yeah. for the high school? So well, I think you're right. If the parents know in advance, it'd be a lot less questions, a lot exactly. less controversy. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Does anybody have any questions or concerns? Is the committee in support of posting it online? I wonder if we could hear from the public because I think there are some. Yeah, is there anybody? Just school. feel free at the public if anything you'd like to say about that. Um, I'm right. Katie Fisher. I think that it's a really good idea to have that stuff all, I mean, I'll just comment and say because I feel like there was a lot of question. Um, I, I, mean, I was just sort of going, yes, 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 please. I want to know everything. But I don't know why we have to start in middle school. I'd say I want to know from K on up. I want. I feel like between all the testing that's going on, it's. For, I don't even know when my child is doing study island or dibbles or, and it's infuriating as a parent to not know when these tests are coming, how many they're going to have that year, and then placement. Um, it's just, I want to know everything all the time. I am that parent. And I know a lot of people that are I that feel parent. there is a lack of transparency. There well, is. And then, and it's fair. It feels like school is a secret, and if I don't start, if I don't get to know my kids' teachers very well, and I have the opportunity, and I can, but there's so many parents out there that just don't have the time or the resources or whatever. It's um, like the more I know, the better off I am, and the more opportunity I have to help my child. But yeah. like you guys were saying, like you were saying, in a selective course. Oh, oh sorry, Sandra Marciano, mm -hmm. um, 110 Clarion Drive. Thank you. Um, but you know, is it even in, even in elementary school in the math levels that are different, and the kids come home and they know if they're in the high math, the highest math, the middle, or the lowest. I mean, they know in, in fourth grade which classes, which teachers are, and we don't know as parents. And so, you know, it, it even starts, you know, in before middle school, like you were saying, the honors of what they would be directed. But the kids figure it out. Yeah. So it should be. It might as well be out there. It might as well be yeah, out there. This is a step in the right direction. It also shows, I think, yeah, that this, if we keep it secret or something. Yeah. 
then the end, it hurts more people's feelings because it's not secret. I just want to know. So what can we work on? How can we make her? Because then we can help them, you know, we can focus on the areas that then, that they've tested about and whatnot, then we know what's working. What is a natural curiosity for a parent to want to know how they fit in? Would it be possible, I'm wondering, to get on the website from each grade, kindergarten up through 12th, a listing of the testing that will be done each year and what we that testing that. measures. That, that, that's but, already there. That's already there? The, like the, a very the testing clear... schedule is put out every year but, with regard to dibbles, um, with dibbles and study island. Those things, th those tests are not tests that we want parents to sit at home and study with their children no, because they're indicators. But the child has to see the grade that comes up and I want to be able to explain But it's not, it's not a grade or, for like, them. There's like a, one, one test has like a ranking because she'll come home or it they'll come home. Study that says, I only got a 65, well, well, my teacher was mad at us, gave us, you know, like that kind of and thing. That, and that's shame on the teacher because that study island is an indicator. And it's an indicator of saying how the child is gaining the core instruction from the teacher. So if the, if the child didn't do well, it's not the child's fault. Well, <laughs> I think though also what I've seen from the study island, when they, when they do come out, like the ranking, it's green, Orange and red. Correct. Mm -hmm. And and the red is lower. And Correct. Then, so I, I think they, they sort of can even figure it out from. Well, they're, they but they should. Right. They should. Yeah. Excuse me yeah. for intervening, but um, the, the intention for the, the study island it is a benchmark. They call it a benchmark test, and it's a diagnostic tool. So meant to help the teacher guide their instruction. Right. For the students, that's the main goal. They're very discouraging tests to the students. I'm not just speaking for my child, but like I go into schools a lot. Like I know that the kids are, they see the results. I don't think the kids should see the results necessarily. Mm -hmm. I think they can take the test and let the teacher see the results and the teacher can, at the elementary school age, um, they are discouraged. Well, that does speak to the pressure that I'm hearing that the kids are under with all the testing. Well, why I, do they I have to see every single benchmark? If it's a teacher assessment, why are the kids? Yeah, if it's an internal benchmark, well, why, I mean, why not? Why, why, why would we open up? Sometimes they're doing. Sometimes they use it for the child who may not be applying themselves as hard. That that we know that the child is performing and achieving at a better um, rate than what they're indicating and. What's happening is, is if they are just taking this this particular benchmark as hmm, whatever, then that's the same effort they're going to put into the PSSA, which has a more no. more of an impact. Like a parent issue though? Shouldn't that be a discussion with a parent rather than like an inquisition with the child? It, I, it, it shouldn't be an inquisition. No. I don't think it's ever been set up like that it way. Is. But it's telling me it is. She, I mean, my daughter does well in school. Mm -hmm. um, she had, you know, all these nerve work hard. She's about middle of the road. But she gets those tests back and she sees that she didn't score like green and is crying at the end of the day. And I'm not mm. even kidding. Like it is like these tests are constant and they're even you know, you know they're they pretty regular and they're very the stay stay island should only be three times a year. It's, it's, it's three times a year. Yeah, yeah, I feel like I we're feel doing like we've already like, had it like two or three times. And if it's not study island, what else is there? We probably three, have three. had it. There's, there's one that she does not have time. Like, okay, so they've had it twice. Okay, but there's something had it twice. else. There is a part of the reading series. Uh huh. That, um, but I don't know, and I, that's why I guess I wish well, I knew. we don't know either. We don't know when they're having it. We don't know how many times they're going to have it. <coughs> when they come home and they're upset because they did see the, you know, the color right there. I see they're seeing it. Most of the, at least in the elementary school, grades three through five, do have some kind of a weekly, just almost like a quiz on vocabulary and comprehension. It's a very short test. Then they also have one that's a unit test, which would be every eight Six, approximately six to eight weeks. So that might be what you're talking about. Yeah, because it seems like it's um, frequent. This, this study on the benchmark test, what it does is it tests what the expectation is for the end of the year. So it gives um, you an idea of how the student would perform if they were to take that end of the year test that day. So it's not so, uncommon for they're you supposed know, to but fail. They will understand right. That. In the beginning, yeah, right. Yeah, but the children don't but understand that. Yeah. And then I can't, without me understanding that, I can't explain it to them. So I'm mm -hmm. like, I don't. I, if you don't have that. kids that are going right. through it, it doesn't right. bother you as much. But as a child, as a mother who has children going through it, or right. you know, as a teacher, that. I'm sure it's very like frustrating. But is this all in preparation for the PSSAs? 
Like, is it is it working up to test them for the PSSAs? No, I, I think, um, like I mentioned before, it should help the teacher say, this student needs help in this. If, you know, this student needs help in this, they already know this. Why waste your time on this particular thing? So it really helps the teacher are differentiate. They, are these tests, um, you know how, like, they, you know, the teachers now are sort of teaching to the test of these, you know, PSSAs, or are they, is, Study Island like a precursor to PSSA? Yes, see, that's what I... I'm it's not a precursor. It, it, it is an indicator. Are they, it, the, they, same, are they the same They're They're, they're or they should the be aligned. Right. Yeah, they're aligned. Yeah. But okay. so, like, I, so it, I, I feel like as a parent that in the school district, they're taking so much time away from instruction and classwork and being a teacher and doing lesson plans and hands-on, like... And they're they're gearing towards all these computerized tests. Like it's every couple of weeks, they're sitting in front of a computer and they're being tested, 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 tested. There's where's the learning? I want to jump in. I think this is a huge topic, and I think we should include it. We can let's talk about it at our next meeting as well, more in depth. It would be great if our administration could look at some of that. But we definitely have a problem from what you both indicated. There's a communication problem. I think yes. we need to convey what tests are being given better than just this testing schedule. Right, and even and between the teachers and the students. Yeah. Are we over testing? That could be at our next meeting, over yeah, testing. It's, it's, more, it's more aligned for the secondary level of when um, the AP testing is taking place, when PSSA, you know, with PSSA, we can only give the month or the, the time frame that is going. We do talk about dibbles and, and the um, other benchmark testing taking place three times a year. It's, you know, if, do you have snow day, like to say a concrete date, it, 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 the testing test schedule had changed so much, but it's not something that we can't go back and look at. There's the something entire. very specific I'd like for the next meeting. If we can get a list with a heading of each grade level from kindergarten to 12, and then a bullet point underneath of what different tests are administered, whether it's PSSA, whether it's Study Island, and even how? Dibbles. And that would be helpful too. Just Maybe what bureaucracy or what level of bureaucracy mandates that we implement those tests because and what's the, the point exactly? A little. What's the point of the test? Is it to prepare for the PSSA? Is it to get an understanding of a, a child's ability to read? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and as a parent, I feel like all it's doing is teaching these kids how to take a test. And yeah. It's, and it's gearing up to take that PSSA. They're teaching to take a test to to score high on the PSSAs, and then there's so much being lost. I want to well, you make, like you make a good point, but I, I think one of the things that teachers use that data to individualize instruction, either to enrich instruction or remediate instruction also. So the data is it's not just to prepare for a test, but it's also to give us good information so that we can And we just we just saw that tonight with the data about the negative growth that is now having us add an AP uh, not an AP an honors language arts class. If you can just state your name for the uh, record. The lights went out again for the sake of the minutes. No. <laughs> um, I agree with what the ladies here are saying as parents. But bear with me because I have a couple of crazy questions, right? Can we, would you mind waiting until the end of the meeting if, if I don't mind? Because we do want to just get through these other two items on the agenda because we are a little bit off trap, off topic already. Thank you. I Sorry, I do appreciate it. Once back to the last topic, <laughs> Brian made a point that I think I skimmed over. Yes. All these tests. I think this question, if I understood it right, is each test, who's mandating them? It's part of the curriculum. They are not. But, 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 but is it common for curriculum? Is this, is it's it's just part, it's part of the curriculum. It's part of... It's been part of the curriculum? Right. Whether you're using dibbles or whether you're using regular benchmarks, DRAs, all right. I'm sorry. I, I asked Mrs. Slattery to wait till the end of the meeting, so I would feel unfair if we go back to this and not let Mrs. Slattery speak. So we're going to come back to this at the end of the meeting. Um, let's talk about GOMAT implementation now for K-1 and 7. Okay. Um, as you know, we have implemented the GOMAT program in mathematics in grades 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Um, and so that our math program is aligned with PA4, um, which we're mandated by the state. And we would like to 
recommend, or I am recommending, that we implement Go Math series for kindergarten and first grade, and then, you know, at the front end, and then at the back end, at seventh grade, so that we have um, consistency and coherence in our math program. So right now, the kindergarten and first grade teachers are using an old series that we had that's not aligned with the new series that we have. So I do have um, some documentation to share with you that just shows what the emphasis is um, now in mathematics as opposed to what the emphasis was in mathematics at those grade levels that I can share with you. Yeah. Yes, please. So what, what, what year is this now for our math? How many? How long have we been? We've had it six, three, two years ago. So we started. We started two years ago, right? Yeah. Only this is right. Right. This is the third year. Two years ago. Not elementary. And then we just start elementary. We kind of moved it in. Right. The go math is this right. And yes. And two, three, four, five. I think we approved in the first. Right. I remember we approved it for. Pardon my ignorance, but what what is go math versus regular math? Is it common core math? Is that what yes. this is? Yes. It's just code word again. It's PA core. Yeah. It's sadly, we're all common math series. Common, common core math. math. Yeah. You, heard it. you heard it good, right? Yeah, yeah. go. That's your standard of the We don't have a choice <laughs> on the PA core. I mean, that's a state um, mandate. Yeah. So. Oh. Right. Um, or Andrew Tide. <laughs> right. <laughs> it even has its own acronym, CC 2.1. Dot K dot A dot one. Here you have mine. Is that wow? Huh. We want to go to the yes, exactly. So um, we just thought this was a natural place for imp implementation, uh, especially at kindergarten and first grade because. We are, well, in seventh grade as well, because we are in the process of writing math curriculum, and we would like to adopt this series to support the curriculum. Yeah. For the next two years that we are tied into the contract of the GoMath, at which time in the next year, because these are all consumable materials, they are not things that we have that'll sit on a shelf, that when you're done, they go away, they get, you know, Razor blades. Yeah. Exactly. So in another year then, what we need to do is we need to bring in all of the different math curriculum for K to 7 and begin to look at what will be the best fit for the Daniel Boone Area School District because we're going to need to bring something. But in the meantime, we need to have some type of consistency for the kids going from, you know, kindergarten to first grade, sixth grade to seventh grade. Well, now that the, these kids have been in it for a couple of years, how, I mean, how... I mean, how is it progressing? We won't know how they do until this math, until this um, year's this, testing, this because is, this will this be the same. This is the first year that oh, the PSSA is, is aligned okay. right. with PA core. <coughs> um, so really, this will be the first time that we're able to see how they're doing. I will say, um, I'm sure that many parents, and we hire oh, a few yeah. parents, don't like it. I'm not sure whether that's um, that they don't like the go math or that they're seeing the transition from the old Pennsylvania content to the new PA4, because they are, they are different. Yeah. Um, so, kids are having, being taught different topics at different grades, mm -hmm. uh, in different, being taught in different ways. Do you want to know why? <laughs> I want to say, as um, my child's in fourth grade, I have a child in fourth grade and a child in sixth grade. Um, she's not getting the basics multiplication and division before she gets put into, um, you know, sometimes she's doing things that look like algebra. And without multiplication and division, algebra is very difficult. And again, it causes a struggle. Like, it's out of order to me. Um, I'd like to jump in there. I had the opportunity yesterday to sit in on a fourth grade go math class. And it was very interesting because I actually had the opportunity to ask the teacher afterwards what her view on go math and not just go math but the common core curriculum was and she said what they're trying to do with this entire go math and common core just use common core because okay. go math is just yeah. the tool right. yeah. Common core. yeah it's okay. just all right okay Whether common it's core then code word. okay so common so for common core what they're trying to do is get students to think more mathematically from the beginning to the end so instead of memorizing the mm -hmm. multiplication tables they're trying to get them to understand why it works right. now that being said 
there's developmental issues there because all students aren't ready right off the bat to think mathematically. You have wait, to understand. I'm sorry, I can't wait anymore. Did you hear what you just said, Mr. Kurtz? I, I yes. Instead of memorizing. Yes. Right. How did everybody up there, will you please tell me which one of you did not memorize as a child? No, yeah, and, but that, yeah. that, does, that doesn't mean it's, it's wrong. It doesn't mean it's wrong. Yeah. It's just yeah. the fact. It's just, no, and, and I'm getting to what I'm getting to is there seems to be a problem with how it, how it's working because everybody we did learn to memorize and then we we learned how it works and then we figured or we learned what it was and then we learned how it worked. Whereas now they're trying to teach not necessarily what the end result is. Yeah. But we really don't have any control over common cores, sadly. We could try to stand we could try to stand in the way and block it. We're gonna be the wave is going to crash over I'll, us, I'll but go we back can. To, to what Mr. Martinez said, people don't want to change. Yeah, I'm still unsure whether this is good or bad. I really, I'm really, my my mind is open, and and I, I think if we're trying to block it. That's not the right move. We can't block it. And the problem yeah. problem with that as parents, we were taught a certain way, and we can't help our kids. That's mm -hmm. the most yeah. frustrating that's part. That's part. But that doesn't mean it, that doesn't mean it's wrong. But now, you know, you know, no, why? Oh, okay. <laughs> but but my problem, I, and I understand that kids, some kids need to learn different ways, and and need to be it needs to be open. Some kids can't follow this, the the old school math and and the format. But that's an IEP. That's that's not every kid. You can't tell me that every kid can't learn math the way that they used to learn. And then if they can't, then there's an IEP for that, and then it should be you know a specialized development. But there's even like he's doing division. And they learn division three different ways. Yeah, but let, let me talk let about me interject. Let me interject yeah, I mean, I can it's tell not you. Mr. Kurtz saying they no, can't, right. or Mrs. Torship, or any of the uh, other I'm people wondering. sitting yeah. up here. It's, it's the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like it or not, until it changes, Common Core is what it is. And yeah, vote according to with, with our governor elect, <laughs> I will tell you right now, he's not going to change it. Now, I give a heads up to the administration. I get a letter today that I share with Mr. Kurtz, and I told him that after he reads it, I would scan it and send it out to everybody. But it's about a new group forming in Daniel Boone School District against Common Core, and this group intends to come to our January meeting, according to this letter. All right. Now, unfortunately, they will have as much success as you three and us. Mrs. Bites and, and myself have been to meetings against Common Core, but it's still here. We still need, need to support the children as best as we can through this. So Maybe a fad. Some people are saying it's a passing fad. But we need to mitigate it as best as we can. So and that's what we as a group and you as a public need to, to do. I, How do I don't we mitigate it's a fad. it? The shame of it is, is that at the end of the day, we're being evaluated and being held hostage on how well our kids do, right. and if we're not preparing it, them properly, we, not opt out? No. we can't opt out of no, PSSA testing at it's all. So and that's where that's where we're being we're being You can, and, mm -hmm. and that yeah, ultimately it hurts, hurts the, 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 the yeah. school. Yeah. It hurts the school district. You cannot opt out at the high school level. Did you say it hurts the school district? It does. It, it ultimately, because it, we're part of the grade that we get is participation. And there, it, it, again, it's... 15% can opt out without impact on the school district. That's my understanding. Well, oh, if it's more than 15, then it's hard. Believe me, well, that's I such mean, an arbitrary time, thing. Yeah, yeah, I like, mean, every well. time we get a, a participation, rate, uh, participation part of the report, it... The whole thing is just it totally messed you. up. Yeah, I know, I know. And I know, I mean, like, I feel like, I know it's... But I know. think some of this um, assessing along the way is not necessary. Well, and, and we, yeah, really look, we, we absolutely need to look at that, but... Let's look at the kids more. But well, we're going to talk about that next meeting. Right. Okay. We're going to talk right. about the testing. Something, though, that was brought up uh, before, I, we did GOMATH, we had a presentation about GOMATH mm -hmm. a few mm -hmm. months ago when we were talking about bringing it to the other levels. And I believe, after speaking with Mr. Martino, he refreshed my memory, the person who was the salesman said that they would provide or it was possible to have lessons for parents how to... And I have that down as a note that we need to do something yeah, we have to, have parent to outreach. Um, understand you know, what's going on and... and parent uh, workshops. Something yeah. along those lines. We do mm -hmm. offer them... Did they them? provide the teacher workshops? Yeah. They so they bought? can actually help the kids. Because yeah. we bought parent <laughs> and, and teacher workshops. 
from them, from that part, it's part of the, it, Yeah, it's part of the whole. And I think that's that important that's because the parent that's, is oh, the yeah, true sure teacher there. in I'm this sure. dynamic. It's the most has, natural has, thing. Does anyone know huh? he's come? Yeah, yeah, we've had, yeah, we've had go, the Go Math we people here. coming out for, for our staff. Yes. We have not yet. Yes. Yes. So yeah. let's pursue it with parents. And we do have, was I think, in that price. we do have some workshops coming up um, in the spring, or it's either winter or early spring uh, at the elementary level, and I think they are going to be doing some math activities. Teachers. For, for, for not the, the not, teacher, not the Again, not we're talking about parents. 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 No, no, right. teachers for parents. Right. The, 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 the teachers will be the best the ones, too. Yeah. Yeah. For the parents. Yes. Yeah. Right. Mr. Ruff gets points. Yeah. In, in school, my best subject was math. I cannot help my grandchildren with their math. Mm -hmm. Can't? No. You can. I can, that's I can help them. When you I can show them how to get the answer. You You're not I can't show them the math. You can. I think can if we flash back to when, I don't know about, you know, I'm probably older than a lot of you here, but I can remember my parents saying the yeah. new math and they couldn't help me. Mm -hmm. so Which, I by think, the way, that new math is coming on. I that's have, bad too. I have a question. <laughs> Is there a different um, curriculum for other than Go Math that isn't quite as bad? Well, Go Math is not a curriculum. Um, or, or no so. textbook is ever intended to be a, a curriculum. Right. Okay. A textbook is a tool to support your curriculum. I think so is there what, another tool, a math book? That I'm would, sure there's a whatever the tool. There are a lot of them the same. same. But it probably will be very yeah. much yeah. the same content. It has to what be four What did we last year? What well, tool was that? It was Hooten Mifflin. Um, so that was a common core. No. no, that was no. Not common. That's why we learned the change. Right. So how, what, do the, what does kindergarten and first grade have right now? Hooten Mifflin. The old. How come they're not state they're not mandated core, to be common core already? They are. And so what they're having to do is, um, you know. Supplement. Yeah. Supplement uh, and, yeah. and yeah. The problem is, is that when this was bought, it wasn't purchased so, in, the, so, in so the proper bottom process. Line, how much is, is K1 and to 7 we're months? we're stuck with yeah. it for five years. The bottom line. So hey, can we just get to the number? Well, <laughs> you have three in. Oh. So for two more years, but for two years, we're just trying to say, can we do the same thing at all the grade levels where we need to use it? And then knowing that we have to go and get something else because unlike other subjects that we can supplement using websites and stuff like that you need to have a math book i saw when i when we approved this last year i had a question because i you see these common core math problems online that just don't make sense right. i know michelle malkin put stuff out and i see that once in a while it just doesn't make any sense at all and from what i understand the go math books they don't they're not that bad they don't have these questions that are just so out there it's a great from, selling job they're not that bad they're not that bad <laughs> okay. but the sad thing is it seems like this is what if we're going with, if we have to do Common Core, and it seems like we do, and this is what we have for every other level, until okay. we can switch over on a large scale, right. and that seems to be the direction I'm hearing from up here, what, what's the cost? What's the cost? And I think what well, we need is for you to be part of a committee sure. to start evaluating the other <coughs> books that are there to support the way math is being pushed down our throats to teach our children in Greek. Grades, you know, K to <laughs> Additionally, we have elected officials at the state level. We have a state representative, a state senator. We have a new governor. Yeah. Uh, the state can opt out. They, the state right. can that's, do stuff. Yes. Uh, yes. So, yeah. I'd love to hear your comments. Yeah. The state yes. can do literally that. Do the rest. The school district. She's, she's done. done. Yeah, she's out. She's done. Yeah. Governor Lowe is not going to opt out. Oh, she was done. At a national level, she was Corbett's. If, if yeah. Mrs. Clinton yeah. is elected yeah. president, She's retired, or if Mr. Know. Bush is elected president, they both favor Common Core. So it, it's not going anywhere anytime soon, I don't think. And remember, Common well, Core was originally, initiated as originally, part of the American Red As a national, yeah. 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 How how could could be be it was an economic incentive. How could they incentive. support it originally? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. that is built. Sure. And that's what it's called. We need to do buy more materials. And by design. It was supposed to, it was yeah. yeah, I mean, the only reason that, that some of it's held up is because the state can't afford to pay for all the, the new the new Keystone testing, right? To, uh, the old, the old I know the history. I just don't. All right. She just has one more thing she'd like to ask. Was, was the question you're actually raising here that we want to buy books at these levels? Yes. Do we, do we have a cost? For, for the, that's what I, that was. And she said she good going. news, so I'm like, the all good here. news is. <laughs> I built the purchase of math textbooks into the Ready to Learn grant because it could. The grant, like Mrs. Torsha said before, a lot of it um, is geared towards 
K through three in those early childhood grades. And so I was able to write curriculum through that grant for K through three and purchase the textbooks to support the curriculum. So we can do have the money to pay for the kindergarten and first grade. Not the seventh grade. And is that money already earmarked for this, or is yes. it earmarked for something else? No. Okay, so it's we're right. not talking about adding any more expenses no. at this well, point, ex except for seven. Seven. And right. what does that cost? But we we also have put a placeholder in the budget for next year. Right. Okay, so it's not like we're talking about going above and beyond what we've already figured out. Okay, all of it. The grant will pay for the seven. Right. And again, these are disposable, you said. That being said, when we're switch, if we switch to a new system, we have to teach the staff. I mean, that'll be a new discussion at a later date, I guess. Would you be better off having the prep in first and second? It doesn't matter. It's going to be the same concept. So we're going to have to get involved with people. This is our first year, and like, you know, my fourth grader, and, you know, these. It's tough. And A student and he struggled. Right. That's the way to say it. And it's a shame that we couldn't have rolled it out because there's going to be a gap someplace that we're going to have to pay. And teachers are scrambling, I think, this year. It seems like there's going to be a group coming next meeting about Common Core. So let's allocate a lot of time to discuss that at our, at our next committee meeting, at the, hopefully the beginning of January. <laughs> So what, what Mrs. Weber just told you was it's going to work. Oh, I yeah. agree. So to make it work, and they make it work with me. They said, oh, I'm like, help me. Um, and they sent home tutorials for me. So I will say they're doing this. So you're relearning everything. I'm relearning. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, subject, well, last thing on the agenda, then public comment, and Mrs. Slattery, I didn't forget. <laughs> Um, subject course materials need assessment. I believe I, when I was in Mrs. Lamont's math class, I found these two books that I asked to borrow. This is the science book that was on the desk. It's 20 years old. It has Pluto still as a planet and the old um, food pyramid. I didn't look through the entire thing, but just skimming through, there's a lot of stuff in here. You mean the food pyramid changed? Oh, yeah, the food yeah. pyramid changed like six years ago. And then they have the Pennsylvania history that says uh, that Tom Ridge is the governor. And that was the case back in the 90s. And I don't know, I know right now they supplement these materials, so it's not like his are learning fact from these books, and there are other resources. But what I'd like to know, I know that we've, I don't want to say had a moratorium on textbook purchases, because we haven't necessarily, but these things need to be updated at some point. Absolutely. And what I'm wondering is, do you guys have a timetable for that, the administration? And if not, I think we should begin to look at that, and if necessary, build it into future budgets. It's part of the curriculum writing. Okay. So, you need to write curriculum first, because the textbooks doesn't drive curriculum. It's the resource. Mm -hmm. And then you have to determine how much money you want to put into something that is going to age itself out quickly, you know, as governors change, depending on what information they're putting in there. So much, and the other thing is, is that do we want to put money into books or are we putting money into technology? Do we want one-to-one -one initiatives? Do we want kids to have, um, you know, uh, smartphones, you know, iPads, um, that kind of stuff? So where the curriculum would be all online, where kids are loving to go get it anyway before we put more money into something that's going to get dusty on the shelf. So... <laughs> well, we might not, might, not, might not want to buy them because they could fall out of the Common Core right away. But fortunately, science is not um, under or being mandated by Common Core. And but English is. Well, English, that's the whole different subject. We're not talking about English, right? They're going to out state level. This year, they're starting with English language arts and math. Right. So that's reading English. They don't test on social studies. Science is tested two times a year. And um, so, so that's why that's where we decided to start curriculum writing was yeah. reading and math. And so this year that's what we're doing. We're writing curriculum for reading and math. Um, yeah. Next year we would like to look at writing curriculum for science right. and social studies. At that time, we would like to make a recommendation for a new science okay. book. If we realize that those books are really outdated, it's just a matter of having to prioritize. Okay. Okay. Do you have any more of those? Oh, yeah. Documents? I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. Right. So I, I know part of what we have been doing is we've been using the Ready to Learn money to put um, some of the technology into place. There are Chromebooks that have been purchased, um, you know, but um, 
we're tied. So if we're not getting money that we can spend down from the government, it's, it's tough to take it out of the general budget mm -hmm. because the monies have not been there. So I'll let you continue. I'm, I apologize for Oh, no, it's on. just, you know, it's just. So um, we know they're old. Okay. We do have the curriculum that we provided for you over there to show you what we are using to help um, guide the teachers that they have rewritten it. It's, it's um, within five years that they had been written. Right. So um, the state has not changed what they consider to be tested for science this year. And so what we have still aligns with um, what the state expectations right. are. Most of the teachers, I don't believe teachers are really using those books. No. This is train, trainer created binders for each topic in science from K through eight. Um, I don't know, maybe wow. five years ago. Mm -hmm. The teachers did. The teachers they wrote quick. Right. Yeah. And then as a result, the binders were created so that they knew exactly where they could go to help teach, you know, machines or simple. Is um, that, are these the binders we're talking about? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's just a sample. Yeah, That's yeah. fourth grade. So was this, we have them in K to eight. Was this done in lieu of having current textbooks? Is that was this like, oh, this is the way we can put a band aid on this? And it's not uh, a band aid. It, it was done as a result of making sure that our curriculum was aligned. But instead of having to purchase yeah. the cost, the number of books that you would have to, to purchase, and because they do run themselves out. Because of the changes, and it's a lot easier science. to replace there, a there are changes page in here in the textbook with updated information. Level, I was at um, an administrative meeting, and there was a conversation, and it was a one-to-one -one meeting, like a one-to-one -one technology meeting, a textbook purchasing, and/or having your staff write their own textbooks. Like, there's any number, and different districts are doing different things, and the, there's pluses and minuses each. If you have similar to this, then the teachers create the curriculum, and then the documents that are used. They can modify, they can keep it up to date, and in science, I think that's what they did. But maintaining it is part of the problem. Right. But there's How a lot of we do that with our contract? Like, wouldn't that be a conflict in the contract with how the teachers? Well, that would be a topic for executive right session. Yeah. <laughs> they, they get paid. Yeah. Would that be quite they, a? They get paid, or else it happens on an in-service day where the group of people that are writing are doing that, opposed to the other staff development. Um, they are people that are very vested in the curriculum and aligning and making sure that it's flowing K to 12 and that it's flowing, you know, um, as well, you know, between the buildings. Just to um, clarity from the other curriculum members, um, no book, books are published for the whole nation. So oh, yeah. no one science book matches the Pennsylvania right. curriculum. That's, an, uh, there are versions, that's the genesis there of are, Common Core. There are versions that are adapted and modified to be a Pennsylvania version. When we look at textbooks, there are the standard version, and then there are the Pennsylvania versions okay. that make sure that they're more closely aligned to Pennsylvania. But there's but really, if you look at the Common like, Core in Pennsylvania, there's not much difference. All right. That's just that. <laughs> In Pennsylvania, National Public Yeah, I think three so. Yeah, Pennsylvania yeah. flavor is a marketing yeah. technique. Yeah. All right. I, I, I want to move on to public comment now. We're going to talk a lot about Common Core at our next meeting, as well as possibly a one to one, just initiating that, that discussion about technology. And Mr. Matz will be here to present mm -hmm. on that. Okay. Um, and then we'll talk about Common Core. Uh, Mrs. Sladry, do you, would you like to, to speak now? Thank you very much for waiting. I wanted to make sure we were on topic earlier as much as I could. It does, it does cost us money to have benchmark tests with regard to Study Island because we do pay a subscription to it. So, yes. We yeah. pay for the benchmarks and then we pay for time because we're taking it away from classroom. And I guess what confuses me is that as teachers, you spend time to develop curriculum and then you, you have normal testing like we used to have back in the dinosaur days. And doesn't that normal testing don't you already have a benchmark of where Johnny, Sally, and Susie are? It's not drilling down to the level that the benchmark is. That's a common um, assessment, and it's really, when you're testing, like for a math test, you're, you're testing to see if they can regurgitate what they learned in the last lesson. 
But what we're doing with the benchmark testing is, is that we're going all the way back to the very first lesson and trying to see how much of that information they're continuing to carry over and to you know, take all the way to the end so that at the end of the day, we have a well-rounded person in math that they you know, are considering. how the curriculum normally? I mean, don't you want to make sure that you, you do? Just just the corporate corporate we're carrying over in December? The piece that I think the study I read, there are all the assessments of the PVAX and the things we look at, it helps is it does the analysis, and not that you as a teacher can't do analysis, but it's the trade off of the time that it does the analysis, it determines the trends, it gives you the information that helps you make better decisions in the classroom about your instructional practices. And so it's the trade off of the balance of yes, the students are doing more testing and, and, and whatnot. But am I making sure that when I'm instructing them, I'm instructing them on the side that they need? And I'm getting the feedback that, okay, they're good on this, I can then teach this topic. So I, I, I'm not saying that they need to be tested perhaps as much as they are, but there is value to it in the analysis piece. I mean, I'm a math person and I can do analysis and I can break things down and everything else, but not everybody is. And oftentimes, I know when we got our PMAS results back, it gave teachers a real good indicator of what they needed to do, and, and they needed to really consider it. And, and it's not a piece that you, you know, yes, there's a cost to it, but you know, what's the benefit versus the cost? I, the I think what would be valuable is if we could sit down, if you would like to sit down with Mrs. Kiesel or Mr. Hurley, because these are really my data experts, and they could blank out the name of the child and they could show what is what we're pulling out of this, that, that we're able to identify a child who has no clue about short vowel sounds and that no matter what's doing, happening in the large instruction area, the teacher's not picking up on it until we can see that every single question on this test that had to do with a short vowel sound, this <coughs> child struggled with. And then we can then say, okay, we're gonna work on specific activities, specifically with Johnny on short vowel sounds. And that's going, and then tip, then I don't, I don't wanna say every time, but a lot of time once we've been able to identify that, then Johnny's able to move on. But I think it would be helpful for you to see what we're really getting as a result of it. With me saying that though, I do hear and understand what parents are saying with the anxiety of testing. Anxiety. And, and that if you're better prepared and you can say, sweetie, this, has, this, this, is, this is testing the teacher. This, te this The teacher gets the grade. So if you don't get a red mark, she's not getting the red mark. But, but or he. Then, I mean, I've been in, and I've been in a situation where, not this year. Sorry, Mrs. Slattery, son, I didn't mean to. That the teacher, the kids didn't do so good in that, in, in their testing. And the teacher yelled at the kids and because we, it came again. And we need to examine that because yeah, the kids aren't right, responsible for doing the right. teaching. But I'm sorry, yeah, Mrs. Slattery. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Well, I think one, oh, I'm sorry. You just told her to go ahead. <laughs> and I can be. Go ahead. And I guess I'm just wondering, and you don't have to answer me now, just something I'm throwing out there, sort of hoping that we've all thought about is holistically, as a district, are we learning anything as a whole, or is it strictly about, are we learning anything of saying, like, gee, there's a red flag in third grade, we're not quite getting this dirt. Absolutely. That, that is that is part of what we're doing in the buildings where we're having data team meetings and it's the teacher and the the, the, the the administrator that are going over and yes they are and we were able to fill in those holes and I'm going to let Rob speak to that. Yeah, because absolutely. I, we pull a lot of data from these tests themselves and teachers get together and we identify kids in need of remediation, in need of enrichment. We put them in some of the programs that we have at the elementary school and it's the WIN program. Um, we have a, at the middle school we have a our reading program and our math program with Odyssey, and that's where. So we identify those particular thing, the needs of the kids, and we try to use that data. We try to use that data to identify the, the particular needs and address. Them. And as a whole, by by what Mrs. Rexrow brought forth is that we always think our above average achievers are doing great and that they're they're achieving. But what the data is showing us is that yeah, they're achieving, but they're not growing. They are not growing their minds. And so by what she wants to do is, that's why she wants to put this middle school starting in sixth grade, this honors group together, because we need to continue to grow them. They can ace those tests, but they're not, their numbers staying the same. And, and we're being evaluated on how we're growing above average learners as well. So if we didn't have that information, we would just continue doing what we've always done. And so that's the, the wealth of what we're getting from the misery that your poor children are going through and trying to drill down to, to those you know finite pieces of 
and, and I just want to add, one of the things that I've noticed since I've been in education for many, many years is I think it's gotten so much more scientific and we're not used to it. It, it really is. It's, it's, we're, we're diagnosing. It's becoming more like um, medicine and engineering mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and, and that, you know, I think that came out of no child left behind well, yeah, and because accountability. What they're supposed to be doing is it's supposed to be reducing the number of students that we are channeling into having individual education plans and that we are making sure that the, that they're getting the core instruction and if not what's going on and is it always a learning problem or is it an instruction problem I want to we we're already a little bit over we can go on for about five maybe ten more minutes um, additionally I think the administration Mrs. Slider do you have more questions yeah. oh okay well if that's the case then I guess does anybody else any other public comment Giving my time. We, my administration, are happy to meet with any of you one on one, small group, um, to, to, to go over any of the questions that you would have, you know, to, to personalize it, to spend the amount of time that you would like. Um, I know that, and I can feel for you the frustration that your children might be having, but we need to work together as to what you're feeling and how we, can we go about better preparing them for these tests that are really informational testing on us, not so much you're going to pass fourth grade as a result of them. With not, that so. being said, at our next meeting, I want, I'll want i dedicate on the agenda a lot of time to talk about Common Core as well as the one-to-one -one program. And perhaps, and this is something we could discuss right now, maybe we could invite our legislators as well to tell us what they're doing. So the to, next, uh, curriculum next curriculum meeting. Which is when? Are we setting a date? It would be, it'll be in January. I'd like to do it in early January. Not the first yeah. week. Maybe the second week. Yeah. I'm not sure um, yet. And what was the letter that, that the Common Core group was coming? Um, I haven't actually read the whole thing yet. Mr. Martino, it was sent to Mr. Martino. Um, there's going to be a group coming. Are they saying that they are going to give us their Facebook identity or whatever? I... It was sent to Mr. Martino, so I wouldn't be comfortable doing that. I don't know if it looks like, I don't know, it wasn't sent to me. <laughs> Before we close, I also want to thank you. It, it really, I think it's great that you're showing an interest, and we rarely have anyone in the audience. Yeah, it's so hard, and I just, you know, five o'clock is tough. I know well, you guys are like, we're hungry. And that, but that's why it's better for you if, the, if you have the time during the day when the kids are in school to come in. I mean. You know, that's perfect for us. I just have one and thing then, to add to the and hopper. And I appreciate for, you guys being open and, and, and you know, for, uh, like with oh, the, the, hearing us oh, with the, the kids time. being anxious with this testing and you're going to look at, you know, the timelines and things like that. Mm -hmm. then at least, and inform us a little bit more because then we can at least be more informed. It, it can help the situation a lot. We're getting better. We're, we're getting better at being able to, um, be more consistent in the way that we're laying things out, and I have to say it's because you know the administration that we have, that we're all working, you know, in, in a different way, and it's it's the same. <laughs> so you know, absolutely, we're happy to. Mr. Rathkeb has something. Well, actually, I'd like some resolution. Would we like to invite our legislators here to give us an update on what they're doing to address yeah. Common Core? Is that something we'd like to do? If not, I don't want to waste time. You want to make it an extra long meeting? I think Since this is gonna... already going to be a really long meeting. If yeah. we're going to have Scott come in and talk about <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, that's true. We might be packing the agenda. Yeah, them. Well, we can talk about doing it later oh, if that's the case. And who knows if they'll show yeah, up, but I think that would be telling you. Would you like um, to see I, I wasn't necessarily planning on that, but yeah, there was, yeah. All right, so we won't invite anybody. Just add to our, our long discussion about about testing. I'm sure, Mrs. Weber has, has already probably, probably thought about this, but my kids comment about, oh, why did I even have to go to school today? They were keystones, and all I did was sit around. <laughs> So I just thought I'd add that one out there. <laughs> yeah. Well, because it's part of their 180 days of attendance, and we have to squeeze those things in at that same time. Yeah, Is that for during the meeting? Can I read this? Yeah, read sure. Yeah, I want All right. And I have to understand that this person is dead set against common core, but he doesn't seem to understand that it's not the district's fault either. Okay. So let me read it to you sure. verbatim. Dear Rich, congratulations on your appointment to president of the board for another term. I apologize for sending this to your home. However, I fear it may be intercepted by the powers that be in the district. Oh. 
<laughs> Scott, a conspiracy Scott. theory. My Get my letter of resignation. Um, my concern is the emphasis on the nope, common she board of schools. I see that there are now links to the contra controversial PA common board and fear that the new and inexperienced administrators may be spending or spend too much of our taxpayer dollars developing curriculum or training staff to align with PA common core expectations. And see again. They don't know that the it's state. They don't have any choice. Right, yeah. The state of Pennsylvania, despite approval of their common core, still emphasizes that local school boards, this is in bold print, slash taxpayers have control over the district's curriculum. There is no requirement to follow or develop new curriculum that reflects completely the PA Common Core, which may be challenged, changed, or extinguished with legal issues and political posturing. Unfortunately, I fear that some of your leaders are buying into the core movement. I see that you spent over $25,000 on the purchase of Go Math books, despite the lukewarm endorsement of the elementary teacher endorsing it. I also heard that a recent in-service brought in outside trainers, one keynote speaker from a district with a lower rating than ours, 83 to 75, to talk about following national trends. I wonder how much this in-service costs. Don't our students deserve better than this common core nonsense? You have poked fun at it on your own Facebook page, and I have. There are many organizations devoted to fight against implementing common core, and surrounding states have disposed of it after initially adopting it, for a race to the top dollars. Talk to your well-paid administration slash legal team and find out what their expertise is. I am starting an organization in Douglasville to oppose anything I see that will cost us, the taxpayers, more dollars, and we will be asking questions concerning this at your January meeting. I'll, I'll keep his name private because it was sent to me personally, but if you come to the January meeting, you may get a chance to hear him. And that's the January. Like, is that the? He doesn't say. He just says, "I just read what it said." January meeting. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, we can. Uh, we can yeah, probably. Well, we can still talk about. I mean, this is where the discussion actually happens. Yeah. The meetings, the full board meetings, are for board discussion. Yeah, this is where we can interact. Okay, I'm not interested in hearing battles. I'm interested in solving a problem. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. and yeah. hopefully, we, and we all are as well. I wish we could keep politics out of education. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's under the policy department of education. Yeah, yeah we'd be fine then. Uh -huh. Well, I'm not about fine. Government out of it. Next date? Next date, not sure yet. Um, we'll, yeah, I'll send out an email. We'll figure it out. Okay. It'll be in January. Not sure we have to figure that out. But with that being said, any further comments from the committee? All right, the meeting is adjourned at 6.45 p.m. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.